Good evening. This is VK3EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, broadcasting on 3541 kHz in the 80 metre amateur radio band and simulcasting on 160 metres, VK3, that is 160 metres, on 1865 kHz in the 160 metre amateur radio band. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel with the uh, regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Tonight we are broadcasting amplitude modulation um, on both bands on AM uh, on uh, 160 and 80 meters. It's a bit of an experiment tonight on 80. So if you have uh, super fi uh, the AM mode on, on your receiver uh, I would sele su suggest selecting uh, AM for high fidelity AM <laughs> or near enough to it. Anyway, um, we are also uh, broadcasting through the Melbourne TV repeater, VK3RTV, digital channel number one. Good evening to everybody watching on ATV tonight. I've got two cameras on me tonight and I keep looking at the wrong one. Uh, <laughs> so we've got the USB camera on me tonight with the uh, super wide angle lens and uh, Sandra Bullock in the far distant background. Just realised that uh, she's in shot. Anyway... <laughs> Good evening everybody, trust everybody as well. Uh, please send the reports tonight of the AM quality signal uh, coming in uh, on 80 metres particularly. Um, we're broadcasting uh, uh, around about 100 watts. Oh, what are you doing home? Aren't you meant to be away? Anyway. <laughs> oh, alright, okay. <laughs> okay, it's producer in the background there. So yes, uh, good evening everyone, and uh, trust that everybody is okay. We're also streaming on YouTube, so if you want to get um, the HD uh, version of tonight, uh, by all means go to the uh, HD channel, uh, YouTube channel, uh, which you can find on um, YouTube, and uh, just search VK3CSJ in the, uh, the tube search engine, and uh, you look for the little live symbol and all should be okay now tonight is going to be a special broadcast i'm not going to be on camera for most of it in fact um i'm going to run uh the entire podcast of an interview with uh, dr uh susie she uh courtesy of uh, brendan o'brien um astrophys uh, website uh so um uh it goes for a, a while i was going to split it up into two halves but um at the end of the day, I just thought it would be better to uh, run the entire interview um, un, 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 uninterrupted with the, with the occasional break in for, for ID, if I can manage that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we also have a chat window, Discord chat window. So if anybody wishes to come up on the, uh, the Discord uh, chat window, you can find that on the ASV website under the Radio Astronomy tab, um, where it has the uh, link to the ASV broadcast. Uh, there's a, a little uh, icon, radio telescope icon, uh, which has got the Discord on it, I think. And click on that, and that'll go in. Be you'll be introduced into Discord. Um, so uh, we already have a few people up there on uh, on the Discord uh, chat window that I can see. So a very pleasant good evening to Kim the K5 FUSE. I think that's you, Kim. Uh, and um, Martin VK seven JAH. I hope the AM signal is getting down to you, okay, Martin. Uh, also, good day to Paul VK three Delta Alpha. Um, and uh, he says uh, on AM a good uh, good good uh, into Balnearing good quality broadcast. Fine, excellent stuff. And uh, we also have Dave VK three JL who's just joined in. Um, hello, Dave. And um, all right. Uh, we also have an email address. Uh, if you wish to send reports, uh, you can uh, send it to uh, vk3ekh at gmail.com. vk3ekh at gmail.com. I'm looking at the inbox as we speak. Well, I'm not right now, though, but I am right now, though. I can see that Don's <laughs> Don vk3hdx has just sent me a report. I better just check that and see what Don's... Uh, oh, wrong mouse. See what he's on about. Um... Oh, of course, I've got everything on the on the bench here. I have to click on it to wake up the mouse. 
and he says uh, uh, 20 over 9 carrier modulating to 30 sounds fantastic on 80 and 160 so he says he loves it and that's what I wanted to hear this is all for you you know that Don <laughs> all right now look like I say we're um, we've got a, a, a full show tonight of this interview with Susie so uh, I, I won't waffle on. I've already used up the, the first five minutes of, of the, uh, the show. Um, firstly, I'll just say uh, uh, a bit of a plug for Brendan O'Brien. He might be very well, very well listening tonight. So good day to you there, Brendan, if you are. <coughs> um, Brendan O'Brien hosts a, fa- a, a, a fabulous fortnightly astronomy podcast about astrophysics, astrophotography, space science and particle physics and tonight the emphasis is a little bit on the particle physics side of it I think. Uh, listen to a different special guest each month and uh, and he also has um, uh, a regular uh, um, a sky guide uh, courtesy of Dr. Ian Astroblog Musgrave is the term they use for him. Anyway, that's Astrophys, and uh, astrophys.com is the website, the URL, uh, astrophys.com, that phys is P-H-I-Z, astro, P-H-I-Z, astrophys.com for Brendan's podcasts, and um, uh, to date he has done, uh, just a quick look at his uh, listing here, um, he has done 148 interviews so far, 148 interviews. Um, averaging anywhere from half an hour to 45 and tonight's going to be about 55 minutes or so so uh, there it is thanks Brendan courtesy of Brendan tonight's broadcast comes to you from t- courtesy of Brendan O'Brien and uh, all right now Susie um, uh, Susie she uh, bring up that part this part's what I want okay all right um, good signals on AM. Both bands here. I would expect Clint. No worries. Thanks, Mike. Dr. Susie She is a physicist, science communicator, and academic who divides her time between her research groups at the University of Oxford and University of Melbourne. Her research addresses both curiosity-driven and applied areas and is currently focused on developing new particle accelerators for applications in medicine. An award-winning public speaker, presenter and science communicator, Susie is dedicated to sharing science beyond the academic community. Her 2008 TED Talk has been viewed over 1.8 million times and she has been an expert TV presenter for a number of Discovery Channel shows, including four seasons of Impossible Engineering. In her talks and shows, she loves to bring real-life demonstrations and experiments, and she has shared these with hundreds and thousands of audience members. The Matter of Everything is her first book. And that's partly what brings me, uh, Dr. Susie She, to me tonight, because uh, it's actually through Brendan O'Brien uh, that uh, I realised that she had has published a book, and that's I'm just bringing it up to the camera right now. Um, I'll just pull it back a little bit, but uh, that's that's uh, that's her new book there, the the matter of everything, twelve experiments that changed the world, and uh, I think what brought my attention more to the book and again thanks to Brendan O'Brien for uh, I just realized I haven't got the studio lights on um, doesn't matter uh, but what brought me to uh, uh, my attention to to Susie more so was her connection with uh, the dark sky site uh, the Leon Mao dark sky site at uh, up at Heathcote um, one of the many things that uh, that uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria are involved in is their dark sky site, which is located uh, about 12 kilometres north of Heathcote, and uh, it's uh, well, it's it's considered a dark sky site. So we have telescopes and radio telescopes, and and uh, the, uh, the 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 1600 odd members of the ASV don't all converge on the uh, on the, the site at once but uh, <laughs> um, but it can get busy up there at times uh, but the um, there's two observation areas that can be set up to observe uh, the sky 
And uh, I know that once your eyes get adjusted to the darkness of the sight and the darkness of the sky, uh, the amount of stars that uh, one can see is, uh, is mind-blowing. Uh, for those that uh, have spent most of their lives in the city areas and probably have never looked up at the sky, well, maybe once, uh, are often blown away, literally, when they uh, get a chance to come to a country location and realise, hey, there's more stars up there. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway, if if I just indulge a little bit, this is this is the introduction. I won't I won't read the because uh, I won't read the whole introduction out. But in Susie's in Susie's new book uh, on uh, uh, on the matter of things, uh, she describes her trip to Leon Mao Dark Sky site. And on on page one uh, of the introduction is this uh, wonderful little collection of her thoughts about um, her, f her first journey to the Leon Mao Dark Sky Site, a part of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. She sat, starts off by saying that five years early, I had been studying civil engineering at Melbourne University. I had never known that being a physicist was an option. While I enjoyed physics at school or in school, I'd only ever known it leading to a career in engineering. That all changed a year into my university degree when I was invited along by my classmates to an annual highlight of the Physics Student Society calendar, AstroCamp. One Friday afternoon, we left Melbourne and arrived two hours later at the Leon Mao Dark Sky site. The bumpy dirt road led us to Tin Roof Building where we unpacked beer, telescopes and then set up our tents near a large clearing. As the light faded, the temperature dropped <clears throat> and the sound of cicadas began to pierce the air. To preserve my night vision, I used a, pair, a hair tie to hold a piece of red cellophane over my torch light. I clambered into my sleeping bag, great, grateful for its dual function as a source of warmth and an insect barrier. I breathed in the familiar scent of gum trees and then I looked up. There's one, the man next to me shouted. A meteor blazed across the sky. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, the true wonder of this designated dark sky sight revealed itself. The chatter fell to whispers and then turned fell and then in turn fell to a hush. Venus slowly set below the horizon and other planets came into view. Over the course of that night, I got a sense of the slow but constantly changing nature of the night sky. Through my friend's telescopes I saw the magnificent rings around Saturn, familiar from pictures but strangely new through a lens, stars forming in nebula, full of glowing dust and globular clusters sparkling with millions of stars orbiting our galaxy 100,000 light years away. The most spectacular view was the bright band of stars and dust, the glowing arc of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. From the southern hemisphere, we look towards the middle of our disc-shaped galaxy. We're about two-thirds two of the way out from the middle, orbiting our star, which itself is moving within the Milky Way. The, full stop. The galaxy is cruising through space along with its lo local group of gal galaxies at about 600 kilometers per second. Beyond it are billions more like it, stars and nebula, black holes and quasars, matter formed from energy transformed through immense tracks of space and time. The moment was when I truly grasped how small I was, or I should say that moment was when I truly grasped how small I was how short-lived and how I struggled to put words to the magnitude of what I was seeing. The stars and planets weren't up there and I wasn't down here. It was all part of one enormous physical system called the universe. I was a part of it too. Of course I knew that already, but I'd never really felt my place in it until that moment. Suddenly, nothing else mattered. I wanted to know more about gravity, about particles, dark matter and relativity, about stars and atoms and light and energy. Above all, I wanted to know how it was all connected and how I was connected with it. 
I wanted to know if there really was theory of everything. I felt deeply that all this mattered, that it mattered to me as a human, that understanding this was a goal big enough that if I imagined it even a little bit, I'd not have wasted my blip of time as a conscious being. I decided to become a physicist. So that's just one page out of her book, uh, The Matter of Everything, 12 Experiments That Changed Our World. On that note, I shall now segue into this uh, interview with her, courtesy of Brendan O'Brien. And uh, let me see if I can do this without stuffing it up. <laughs> so let me just make sure I've got everything queued up here. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, where the time is 10.15. We might be going a little bit over time tonight. My apologies for that. Uh, but reading that uh, singular page out has definitely uh, added to the time factor. So uh, I'm not particularly worried if you're not particularly worried. <laughs> All right, so let me see if we can get this right. Um, this is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. We're about to uh, replay uh, a podcast courtesy of Brendan O'Brien's astrophys.com. Dr. Susie She, uh, accelerator physics and cancer therapies, the sorts of things that she's been involved with uh, over the last few years. So let me see if we can get this going. Stand by, please. Just going to kill my audio. Today's interview is with a wonderful accelerator physicist, Dr. Susie Shi. Hello, Susie. Hello. Nice to meet you. Today, it's been a long time coming, and I'm really pleased to be speaking with accelerator physicist and author, Dr. Susie Shi, who divides her time between her research groups at the University of Oxford, where she's a visiting lecturer, and the University of Melbourne, where she is a senior lecturer and Baker Ansto Fellow in Medical Accelerator Physics. Now, Thanks for speaking with us, Susie. It's a pleasure. It's nice to be here. Okay, so before we talk about your research programs here and in the UK and your PhD students and your outreach work and your book and medical particle accelerators, can you tell us where you grew up, please, Susie, and tell us how you became interested in the sciences in the first place? Yeah, sure. So I'm originally from Australia and I was actually born in Mildura, which is about a six hour drive outside of Melbourne. And I like to tell people in the UK that that's on the edge of the desert, but they grow oranges there despite that. Uh, so I was there at a very young age and then my family moved uh, into Melbourne in the Bayside area uh, for my uh, schooling and my, my siblings schooling. And in terms of being interested in the sciences, our family was a sort of very curious family. Uh, my father was a maths teacher. Uh, my mother did a number of different jobs, including teaching. And so the, you know, the idea of having, asking lots of questions and having sort of rigorous debates around the dinner table wasn't an unfamiliar one to me growing up. But I think really I had a few inspirational teachers, mostly in, in well, both primary school and high school, um, who really piqued my interest. But it just seemed like in a way I had a sort of natural curiosity that led me to ask lots of questions about nature and the world around me. Um, that's kind of how I got interested in sciences in the first place. But I would say I've always been interested in many intellectual topics. I have an identical twin who went down the sort of humanities, history and philosophy route. And in many ways, we were kind of asking similar questions about the world. I think we both like the, you know, the sort of big questions. And we just took a different approach in how we were addressing those questions. So I think Fundamentally, it just stems from a curiosity about the world and how it works. 
Fantastic. That's great. Okay, so tell us a little bit about those school days and your early ambitions and did those ambitions change? As I said, I was interested in lots of things. Uh, when I was at school, I loved English and literature and things as well, uh, performing arts I did a lot of, so all, all sorts of things. At one point, I wanted to be a vet because I loved animals until I realized there were two fundamental flaws to that plan. And one was that as a vet, you would actually have to spend quite a lot of time with sick animals, which might not be so fun. And the second one is I'm really allergic to fluffy animals. <laughs> And that just wasn't going to work. So, so that changed my ambitions a little bit. I was introduced to the idea of doing engineering by some of my teachers at high school. And so I even did some work experience in uh, civil engineering in, in Australia. I think I got to photocopy the plans for Fed Square, uh, which probably dates when my work experience was. And so I, I became interested in engineering, mostly because at that time it really seemed to be kind of what one did with good maths and science grades in high school. It seemed that, you know, do something pragmatic in the world. You know, this is a sort of clear trajectory in terms of profession. It's well rewarded. And so I went to university to study engineering. And it was only at university that I really got excited about physics. And that really came from the idea of being able to ask questions that didn't have answers yet, rather than applying the knowledge that we already had, which I felt like was what, what engineering did. Now, of course, I realise that engineering also has uh, research in it as well as, as, well as application and, and commercial application. But really, it was those early explorations into things like optics, modern physics and these subjects and um, astronomy as well that really made me think more broadly about exactly what it was that I wanted to spend my days working on. Fantastic. Okay. So after your successful school career, you completed your bachelor's degree at Melbourne Uni with first class honours in physics. And then you moved over to Oxford, where you were awarded your PhD for your thesis, in which you designed a new type of compact particle accelerator, which could accelerate both protons and carbon ions up to the energies required for clinical use in medicine. Now, the one called Emma sounds awesome. Uh, I just listened to your recent Triple R FM interview, and you mentioned your PhD students that you supervise. Could you give us a skinny on one of their research projects uh, that you're supporting, if that's allowed, Susie? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, most of my work is pretty pretty open, so I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, so one of the things that really inspired me to, to make the move to Oxford and do my PhD in accelerators rather than particle physics or astrophysics or, or these other things was when I found out that you can use this amazing physics that we uh, are learning about how particle beams behave and then you can help use that to actually directly affect people's lives through cancer treatment. So around one in two of all cancer patients in Australia or the UK is actually treated using a little particle accelerator in a process called radiotherapy. That's where electrons get converted to x-rays to treat patients. Now, my own prior research, and I still work in this area, is on much more precise forms of radiotherapy using heavier charged particles, as you referred to, the protons and carbon ions. But actually, in recent years, and the project I, I'm going to mention here from one of my students, I became sort of aware of, of a global challenge in this area. Now, in our countries, in our high-income countries, 50% of patients that need it have access to this technology. And it's one of the reasons why our cancer treatment rates are so much better than they were, say, 40, 50 years ago. But if you live in a low or middle income country, your chances of having access to that technology decline dramatically. And there's an enormous shortfall of radiotherapy systems in low and middle income countries, particularly in areas like sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia. And I only really became fully aware of this challenge in about 2015, 2016, when I attended a conference hosted by CERN and a number of other organizations that really highlighted this and brought, brought me into contact with some incredible oncologists, medical physicists from places like Nigeria, Botswana, Zimbabwe. And I mean, first of all, their stories were incredible, but second of all, the challenges they were facing were enormous. And what we found 
through that collaboration, which I'm, I'm now uh, a member of, it's called Stella. What we found is that the technology itself is not well designed for use in often in low and middle income countries or in so-called challenging environments. Now, we have challenging environments in Australia as well. We have extremes of temperature. We have large distances that people might have to travel to access treatment centres or hospitals that have this technology. So this is relevant also to our geographical situation. But one of the things that we found was that there wasn't a lot of data on exactly what was going wrong with these machines because anecdotally they break more often, they have more downtime, you know, they, they have more problems in these countries than in the sort of pristine, beautifully organised hospital system that we might have access to. And so I really became interested in trying to gather some of that data about these little sort of metre-long particle accelerators. So one of my students at Melbourne University at the moment and a, another former student in Oxford have really done some of the first statistical work in trying to gather this information, which has involved you know, going to Nigeria, Botswana, Indonesia, working with uh, medical physicists and people in hospitals there, trawling through handwritten logbooks to understand the failures and the, the causes of failure of these machines, and then pulling back from that and then un- learning what we can from that. So one of my students here in Melbourne is studying a particular component, which is called a multi-leaf collimator, which shapes the X-ray distribution before it's delivered to the patient. So it's appropriately targeted at the cancer. And he found in particular that that this component has a very high failure rate. Uh, And so now he's studying ways that we might be able to reduce that failure rate by re-engineering the system and improving it. So there are plans in the works in this international collaboration to potentially redesign the technology from the ground up. Um, But I think there's a lot of work that we can do just in understanding and gathering data and you know, building the case and the understanding for what exactly is happening when we try and use this really high-tech cancer treatment technology in an environment that it wasn't initially designed for. So that's a project that I'm really passionate about, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where that goes in future. Wow, the stellar collaboration. It sounds wonderful. And it must be wonderful to be nurturing that next generation of physicists. So In turn, Susie, could you tell us about some of the people who have inspired and supported your science journey? And apart from the PhDs you supervise, who else are you working with? Yeah, right. So uh, I I, I mean, I like to say I've been lucky in this, but um, a lot of colleagues have similar experiences. I've had such wonderful mentors and supervisors and everything. So, I mean, one of the people who influenced me the most was my own PhD supervisor, Professor Ken Peach. Uh, And he was the one who sort of opened my eyes to this idea of using particle physics technology in a societal domain. So he really inspired me, but has also been there throughout my scientific career uh, to support me as well. So uh, in in many different ways, um, whether that's putting my name in for things, whether that's telling people about my work, you know, that what we call this so-called sponsorship um, of of our people and our colleagues and our mentees is so, so important in in everything, but including in the academic sciences. So I've been uh, incredibly grateful for, for his support. I've also been amazed to find over the years that I've had supporters or people kind of working away in the background, kind of helping me along without me even realising it. And this was something that I really realised a few years out of my PhD was that there are people who are just so generous with their time and energy and uh, supportive of up and coming researchers. And it really inspired me to be one of those people, to be one of those supervisors and mentors who's there in the background, forming connections, putting people's names in, telling people how great my people are. And it really, it it sort of made me be, you know, more proactive in doing that rather than sitting back and thinking, oh, well, you know, I'll challenge this student and if they do well enough, then magically the universe will provide. The real world doesn't work like that. So it's a great opportunity and it's a responsibility uh, as someone who's bringing up the next generation, as you say to actually ensure that both they can do the best work that they can and also that they are going to go out in the world and do something which is both satisfying and interesting to them but also uh, yeah, makes, makes a difference in the world. So in terms of who I'm working with now, 
a huge host of different people I collaborate with. So there's my my research groups, obviously. I have my main one now is in the University of Melbourne. We have a group of about 10 people. Uh, so there's a couple of other academics who I work with here, but mostly I have two postdoctoral researchers and uh, a, a sort of group of PhD students and master's students, all of whom are fabulous, um, love them to bits, they're great. And then I still have three students over in Oxford and a bunch of colleagues in different um, research labs and institutes and groups there uh, who co-supervise those students. So that's kind of my main day-to-day. -day. And then there's all the broader collaborations. So we collaborate with CERN on um, a new experiment, which is going into my new lab here in Melbourne, which I can tell you about if you, you'd like to know. And we collaborate still with people in all these really fascinating, culturally diverse uh, areas of the world. So I've, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time collaborating in Botswana and Nigeria, and as I said, Indonesia as well recently. And then uh, in the USA as well, Switzerland, not just CERN, but also other labs there. Uh, yeah, we've got <laughs> a long, long list. One of my colleagues told me once, oh, Susie, it seems like you know everyone in the field. Uh, sometimes it does feel that, feel that way. <laughs> so. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, become a scientist and work with the rest of the world. Now, and I'll look up Dr. Ken Peach. Now, back to particle accelerators. Most of our listeners will have heard about Europe's Large Hadron Collider, of course, and we featured Japan's Super Keck B accelerator when we spoke with Dr. Tom Browder in an earlier episode. And they would have also heard about a Super Keck B Bell 2 experiment when we spoke with Kate McQueen from Melbourne Uni about her search for dark photons. And we will put our propeller hats on soon, but first, could you set the scene for new listeners and tell us what hadrons are and the basic design of particle accelerators, please, Susie? Well, let's try and do this super quickly. So hadrons are just composite particles made out of quarks uh, as a technical definition what that means for me really is uh, protons light charged ions things like that technically it includes pions and other particles but um, we don't typically use those in a particle accelerator so when i talk about a hadron and including the hadron in the large hadron collider what that means is usually protons but they also do heavier ions including lead and gold i think also at the lhc so it can accelerate different types of charged particles. Yep. Now, the basic design of how you go about designing a particle accelerator, I like to say it has sort of five different ingredients. So there's the source of particles. That can either be if you basically heat up a wire, electrons will jump out, so electrons are super easy. A bit more difficult to get protons, but if you rip hydrogen apart with a voltage, the protons will go one way, the electrons will go the other, so then you've got your protons. So that's getting the particles, then you need to give them some energy, which is the fundamental role of the accelerator is to make something go faster. Uh, but I like to frame that as giving something energy because once you get up to a very high speed, everything's approaching the speed of light. You're not gaining much speed anymore, but you are still gaining in energy or momentum. The way we do that in the olden days, it was using a very high voltage. Nowadays, we typically use radio frequency accelerating systems. So that's the high voltage, uh, you know, high power electromagnetic waves on which the particles are effectively surfing along on that voltage wave in order to gain energy as they go through uh, the accelerator. So that's gaining energy. Then you need to control things. That's where the magnets usually come in. So controlling the beam so that it doesn't just fly off and hit the side of the, the beam pipe. So you can control beams in terms of focusing, in terms of bending, in terms of more complex effects. Just like in astronomy, you would use complex systems of lenses. We use magnets for exactly the same or for a very analogous purpose. So particles, energy, control. The next thing I describe is collision. Uh, that's not always a collider as in colliding two beams of particles, but usually what I mean by that is you're going to use the beam for something. So you're going to uh, either whack it into another particle beam, great, or whack it into a target of some kind to generate a secondary beam, or in some of my ones, put it into a patient and use that energy deposition to treat cancer. And finally, I always say that the last piece is detection or detectors, because there's no point doing all of that if you can't see what you're doing or what's happened. 
So actually detector technology, which is typically more talked about in particle physics, is a crucial part of the accelerator system because you have to be able to observe what you're doing in order to make any sense of it. So that's kind of the fundamental ingredients. I could talk a lot about all the wonderful dynamics about how little particle beams are kind of miniature galaxies swirling around throughout the collider. But we can go into more detail on that later. Fantastic. The clarity is just beautiful, Susie. Okay. Now, CERN's LHC is 27 kilometres in circumference. It's a huge machine that's made some amazing discoveries, but you've been working on and designing these novel and compact accelerators like EMMA that can be used in radiation therapy for cancer treatments. Can you tell us what FFAs are and about the Emma Pamela Hadron therapy and the work that you're currently doing? Right. So as I said before, in radiation therapy, um, we typically just use a little electron accelerator. So here we're looking at heavier particles, like so hadron therapy or so-called charge particle therapy, so protons and carbon ions. And to accelerate those takes a bit more of a beefy accelerator. Nothing like the scale of the LHC, of course, but still since about the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, when the radiobiology of this was first explored, we've needed a pretty hefty particle accelerator of the order of the Australian synchrotron in terms of scale in order to deliver particle beams of sufficient energy to get deep enough inside a patient's body to actually precisely target the tumour with this much more precise way of landing the dose in the right position. So early on in my career during my PhD, I was working on um, this, these projects called Emma, Emma and Pamela. Now they, they were fixed term projects, but I'll, I'll describe them in a second. And what they relied on was this technology, very much still in development, but it's been around for a while, called, as you say, FFAs. So what that stands for is a fixed field accelerator. What I mean by that is a fixed magnetic field in that the magnets in the accelerator don't change their field in time while the particles are accelerated. Now, that requires a little crash course in the difference between different part types of accelerators. And the main two types that we use, one is a synchrotron, just like the Australian synchrotron or the Large Hadron Collider. They're actually both the same type of accelerator in which a particle beam as it gains energy and is accelerated, the magnets have to ramp up strength over time in order to constrain that beam to a single circle. That single 27 kilometer circle in the case of the LHC, a bit smaller in the case of, of the Australian synchrotron. But you can imagine as you increase the energy of the beam, you need a stronger force to confine those particles. And so that's why you have to ramp it up in time. The alternative to that is something called a cyclotron, which is where instead of ramping the magnetic field up in time, the beam as it gains energy kind of spirals outward within a bigger magnet. So you can imagine it it's sort of spiraling outwards from the inside to the outside. And then, of course, once you get up to some high energy, it's going to come outside the big old magnet that you've put it in and you can't do any more with it because you've lost control over it. So this type of machine that I've worked on for a lot of my career, this FFA or fixed field accelerator, it's kind of like taking these two ideas and just filling in the spectrum between them. So we no longer ramp the magnetic field, but we take a much more complex magnetic field than you would in the case of a cyclotron. And instead of varying things in time, we vary things in, for example, in radius as a beam moves out on a, a small spiral. If it sees a different magnetic field, that will have a different effect. And so it's all about tailoring both the magnetic field and the acceleration process to try and do sort of unique things in terms of what we call beam dynamics or literally, you know, how the beam behaves while it's being accelerated in order to achieve new things in the field. And one of the things that we think this type of machine can achieve is a relatively compact machine in which you can reach pretty high energies probably higher than in a cyclotron, but with uh, a much less hefty magnet than in a cyclotron. And the other potential advantage is that we think it could also reach higher intensity beams, so you can literally fit more particles in the beam. That's not always required for cancer treatment, but it's of interest in other applications. 
So what these Emma and Pamela projects back in the day were looking at, when I say back in the day, this was only you know, uh, 2010, 2012 when we built Emma in the UK, is they were really accelerator-based projects where we were really trying to understand, can we accelerate a beam using this method? And there were a lot of people out there who thought that actually for the Emma one in particular, that it actually wouldn't work at all for various technical reasons to do with the acceleration process. And so actually building the first prototype of that and demonstrating that it really worked, that the beam was stable, that we could accelerate a beam in this and that it might have genuinely these real advantages in the real world was an enormous achievement, actually. And it was an absolute, I now realise, a privilege and a pleasure to be able to commission the first of a brand new type of particle accelerator in the world during my PhD to be part of that team and that that excitement. There aren't many brand new types of accelerators that get built in the world. And, you know, something like the LHC takes 30 years in development. And even then it's still just a synchrotron, right? So we still knew that was going to work. <laughs> so, so to actually be involved in that during my PhD, um, I now look back and go, wow, that was quite incredible that I got to have that experience. And I'm really grateful for it. The Pamela project was the medical branch of that project overall. So that was most of what I spent uh, my thesis in terms of the design work doing was trying to apply what we were learning and trying to come up with new ideas um, that would then be able to extend this principle to work in hadron therapy accelerators. And that's something that I've recently come back to and some of my students are now working on again, especially trying to use, instead of the accelerator itself, trying to see where we can take the advantages of that in terms of improving uh, therapy through delivering beams to patients, not in the accelerator, but in the so-called beam line that transports the beam from the main accelerator to the patient treatment room. And we think there's some major advantages and and effectively making it cheaper and faster by doing that. Wow, that sounds fantastic. And the excitement in the lab when you got the first output from Emma must have been astonishing and yeah, <laughs> it was about 3 a.m. We used to do midnight to 8 a.m. shifts. It was tough, but <laughs> yeah, it was. We had champagne in the lab. It was great. <laughs> it sounds like the high from it is still with you, Susie. Okay. Now, you mentioned the Australian synchrotron. Now, visiting the Angsto synchrotron down in Melbourne, your hometown, is on my bucket list. What does happen at the um, Melbourne or the Australian synchrotron? Yeah, sure. So people like to say it's about the size of a football field. That is, that is that's fairly true. Big round building inside of which there is, there's actually two rings of magnets. There's one big ring, which is the main Australian synchrotron ring. And then there's a smaller ring, which actually accelerates the electrons up to inject into the larger one. Now, around that larger ring, there's a whole lot of so-called insertion devices that are designed to literally bend or wiggle the beam, and some of them are actually called wigglers. It's a very literal naming policy in our field. So by wiggling that electron beam around, what people have found is that that emits a particularly intense and very so-called coherent form of light called synchrotron radiation. And the entire facility is based around generating this light. So no one there at the moment uses the electrons, although we're looking at potentially trying to get them out and use them for other things, but they're all about using the mostly x-rays that get generated. So that gives it an incredible breadth of science that you can do down there. One of the issues we we have in explaining the value of something like a synchrotron is actually not that there's not enough applications, but that there's so many and that they cover so many different fields of research that it's hard to cover them all. One that I recently dug into a little bit more was structural biology and the process of x-ray crystallography, which started a long time before we had big facilities like synchrotrons, but now it's an incredibly powerful technique to understand the physical structure of biological molecules and systems, including things like the structure of viruses. So during the COVID pandemic, when almost everything else was shut down, the Australian synchrotron actually went into overdrive mode 
you know, their key staff on their, particularly their crystallography beam lines, were coming in and running things around the clock and, you know, pulling in remote, you know, samples and running them remotely for people while people were working from home. And the whole name of the game with that was trying to understand the physical structure of the virus and the proteins that it contained in order to try and find effectively a weak point, is my understanding. I'm not a biologist, but to try and find a weak point in that, that we could then attach drugs, uh, antivirals, vaccines, et cetera, to in order to actually counter the virus. And there were some you know, early results that came out of the Australian synchrotron that were quite important in that process. And, and that was replicated throughout the world at uh, a lot of the so-called synchrotron light sources. So, you know, many countries have an equivalent facility to the Australian synchrotron. Um, and that was just one of the examples of something that can be done at those facilities that's actually incredibly important, but might not seem immediately obvious to somebody who doesn't work there because it requires a fair level of expertise to kind of dig in and go, what, wait, why is this essential? Why do, you know, you have to understand the physics of the, the beam, you have to understand the, the biology and the idea of structural biology and crystallography. There's a large learning curve you have to go through before you land on the idea that, oh, oh, wait, this is absolutely essential. And it is incredible that we are able to do this at all, but it's incredible that we're able to do this now in our own country and even with people sending in samples remotely. It's amazing. They have many other beam lines down there. So they do everything from you know, archaeology and heritage to environmental applications through to uh, they have a medical beam line down there as well. And I work with a few people who use the beam line down there to look at different new developments in cancer treatment, for example, using different ways of generating or applying x-rays to cancer that works with human biology um, or to understand human biology uh, in order to overcome diseases. The problem is just way too many applications. <laughs> um, they're always oversubscribed with users, these places. There's always more, more amazing science that you could do than time available on the beam lines. So Yes, it sounds like the competition for a beam line would be like the same as a competition astronomers have to get on various telescopes. Now, We'll have some more propeller head. We know that great science is often a really hard slog, and it's not all about eureka moments and serendipitous discoveries. Can we dive in a little deeper here, Susie? And would you like to tell our listeners about any particular issues that you're currently dealing with in one of your own research projects? What sort of tricky problems are you wrestling with? What's driving you crazy? What's really exciting you? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, I've talked already a little bit about the medical accelerators in low middle income countries, and that's a really fascinating issue and question to me because it's so multidisciplinary, right? But I'll, I'll leave that aside for now because one of the other projects that we're working on, that we're spending a lot of time on at the moment and is ramping up really quickly, is a collaboration that we have with CERN where we're looking at taking a, a novel technology that CERN have been trying to developed for about 20 years, they have now collaborated with us to send over part of their accelerator laboratory test system and install it in my lab here in Melbourne. And we call the program the X-Lab, the X-Band Laboratory for Accelerators and Beams. And so that's uh, that was just a really exciting moment, receiving you know, $6 million worth of accelerator equipment from CERN. Awesome. And the whole idea with this is that by increasing the frequency of the electromagnetic waves that are used in accelerators, we might be able to shrink them down and make them smaller, more compact, lighter weight, more portable. New Zealand called Ernest Rutherford stood new applications and new uses. But what was really interesting to me is that, you know, trying to push towards the cutting edge, like or beyond cutting edge, even like that, opens up whole new swathes of research questions that may not be, and this is the tricky problem, may not be as glamorous as the headline research project, right? So I can say, oh, well, you know, we're designing these amazing high frequency X-band accelerators because the next generation of future particle collider will need it. Great. 
or the next generation of medical technology, uh, you know, can be shrunk down to a tenth of its original size, and, and this is going to be transformational in cancer treatment. Well, that's great, but realistically, what are the questions that we're actually asking in the lab? And that's in a completely different domain to these eventual applications. So one of the questions that we need to ask at the moment is, okay, we have this incredibly small scale technology that's been um, shrunk down uh, you know, to this five times smaller than existing technology at least. What does that do? Well, that actually introduces new tolerance limits on the machining and manufacturing. So in order to get these extremely compact accelerators, you have to make them very, very precisely. Now, I'm not talking, you know, like precise as in width of a human hair. I'm talking about a hundredth of the width of a human hair, like one micrometer precision engineering. Oof. That does not exist in Australia at all. We need to mill copper to one micron precision. So there are only about four places in the world that do this, and they do it based on this technology development. So we're really pushing the state of the art there. Now, what's an interesting or tricky problem then? I mean, for me, one of the interesting or tricky problems is trying to explain to people why we need to develop a precision manufacturing industry in Australia so that I can tackle this research project. Thankfully, we do have some wonderful organisations who are designed to do just that. So we're partnering with the Australian National Fabrication Facility, for example, uh, in order to try and share that knowledge from CERN out to Australia and, and upskill in that direction. And that could have transformational capability in areas like um, space and, and other you know, areas that Australia is quite into. But at the moment, we're just there going, we need this. We need to be able to build this. And the next part of the process then is trying to understand how you can actually machine these devices and then get them working reliably in the real world. And that requires all kinds of fascinating understanding of high voltage breakdowns of copper, you know, a lot of testing in the laboratory. And it requires us to basically break in the particle accelerator, almost like you'd break in a solid leather shoe when it's new. Because yep. um, you can't just take a precision machine, high power device where I'm talking 50 megawatts of power that we're pumping into this thing. If that goes wrong, we literally melt the copper <laughs> uh, and, and form a hole in the wall of the particle accelerator or our lab. It's got to be done correctly. And so one of the things we're trying to learn now is, okay, how can you methodically and systematically and with the understanding of the materials and the physics behind it, how can you understand how to reliably break in these new types of accelerators such that they can be used in the real world or used by industry, used in medicine without breaking down all the time? So it's, it's kind of one thing to go and build the first prototype and it's another to understand the science on a level where you can do things reliably. And I find it a really fascinating thing because it takes my brain in all kinds of different directions. It takes me you know, away from electromagnetism for a minute and into precision manufacturing. And then it takes me into you know, high power electromagnetism and then radiation shielding and then you know, all these other different uh, tricky areas. But sometimes it's a hard sell to be able to tell people, well, okay, here's the big picture, but the actual science that I need to deal with right now is the detailed understanding of the material breakdown of copper. I mean, you know, sometimes someone might walk in there and say, well, that understanding of copper doesn't sound very exciting, so I'm not going to fund you, right? And then we're, then we're a bit stuck. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because then, you know, you've got to build up, you've got to get down to this level of detail to build up the body of knowledge in order to do these amazing, big, exciting, important things in the world. And I think that's a tricky problem in our funding systems, but and it can also be a tricky problem to communicate more broadly because, it, you know, we like to talk about the sexy bits of science. <laughs> Stop my rant there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, we've got a beautiful segue here, and we'll give our listeners a taste of what they could look forward to enjoying in your forthcoming book, and we'll talk about that uh, very soon. Now, we won't give away any spoilers on the 12 experiments that changed the world, but would you like to highlight the difference between curiosity-driven research 
and applied research, please, Susie. I would love to speak to that. It's something I've become very passionate about, this question of curiosity-driven versus applied research. Nowadays, when I introduce my research, I say that it crosses between curiosity-driven and applied. Personally, I think that it's a bit of a false dichotomy. Fundamentally, research lets us answer questions, right? It lets us ask and answer questions and gives us a reliable way to do that. And even if you think back to the very origins of science, right? So if you think back to this Francis Bacon in the 16th century, he's often called the father of empiricism or the you know, father of science. One of the things that Francis Bacon said about science and the idea of scientific investigation is that the aim is the practical understanding of nature to improve the human condition. Now, a lot of people have taken that and interpreted that to mean that or well, we should do science for the you know to to literally improve the human condition and and make people live longer or uh, I don't know have easier lives or whatever. Um, but they're missing the bit in the middle, which is understanding of nature, right? Yep. And so you can't have one without the other. This is why I feel it's a false dichotomy because I think it's really important that we understand that both of these are kind of part and parcel of the scientific process. Now. Improving the human condition doesn't just mean in a practical sense in living longer in medical technologies and new iPhones, etc. It also means spiritually, culturally, and in terms of inspiration. So I don't like this competition, as it were, between curiosity-driven and applied research. A lot of people view what I do as applied. Uh, I very much view it as curiosity-driven a lot of the time and vice versa. I know I do not think that one is superior to the other. I do, do not think that one is more necessary than the other. I think they, this whole spectrum has its place. And I think we, we sort of ought to remember that and stop trying to pit people against each other in a feeling of scarcity, um, but rather, you know, realise that these things are, are greater than when we have both of them. Two sides of the same coin. Now, you <laughs> You mentioned COVID-19 earlier, and that has had and is still having a huge impact worldwide. How has it impacted on your travels and your research? Yeah, so I'd actually just started a sort of 50-50 travelling back and forth UK, Australia, um, just before COVID hit. So that's been interesting. Um, as a dual citizen, thankfully, I was able mostly to travel back and forth. I had some delays getting back into Australia uh, when there were few places in hotel quarantine, but water under the bridge now. I think the biggest, there's two biggest impacts, I think. One is it's obviously delayed the startup of my new research program in Australia. Um, the university sector's had a huge financial shortfall uh, and that has affected things, but we're getting there. The other thing I think, and this will take a bit longer to overcome, is just the effect on uh, morale, on networking, on communication. You know, people have tried as best they can, but a lot of that is sustaining existing relationships. It's been more difficult to build new relationships and new collaborations. And that for me has been difficult in starting a new research group to really ensure that those relationships and collaborations are there, especially for uh, my students and staff who rely on them for, uh, you know, for expertise, but also potential future jobs. So I'm sort of, now that things are opening up, really shifting into a mode of, of like, right, you know, where's the best possible opportunity for these people to go and um, spend some good quality time with other experts? And it, it does feel, I, we were just reflecting the other day, how nice it is just to go and sit on the lawn and have lunch together as a research group. It, it feels so long since we've been able to do that. Yeah. So, so yeah, it has affected things. Um, I, I've been uh, pretty lucky. I mean, I was stuck out of either of my labs for the better part of two years. But during that process, as you mentioned, um, I was writing a book. And so for me personally, I have been very lucky not to have been too affected, but you know, everyone has a different story. Yeah, me too, Susie. I'm feeling very safe on a farm in the middle of nowhere. And you're heading back to the UK to Oxford soon for a visit. What are you gonna be doing over there? The main thing I'm going back for actually is to launch this book, which I think we'll talk about in a second. Yep. Um, so that's really exciting and the, the build-up for that is really starting to ramp up. 
I've also got my old lab over there and one of my PhD students is just uh, about to start recommissioning our, uh, an upgraded experiment over there. So it's, it's a little uh, experiment called an ion trap. Um, and so hopefully in between book things, um, I actually hope to spend some time in my, my lab there um, and just sort of oversee some of the, the work of my students over there before I come back over to Melbourne. Excellent. Okay. Well, you have a long and rich history of doing very popular outreach work, your TEDx presentations, you're on YouTube, on radio, television, web talks, you're quoted in articles in a huge range of publications. Uh, you've just got your book coming out soon. Can you tell us why outreach is so important for you? Uh, this is, yeah, that's such a great question. And thank you for asking it. I, my philosophy on this is really uh, that science is not something that's separate from society, right? Science is done by members of society who happen to be called scientists like me. Um, but science is a part of our culture. So to me, the idea of hiding away and only talking about this with other members of the club, other scientists, makes very little sense to me, right? The questions that we ask, the creative ideas that we incorporate, uh, inventions that may come from our understanding that might benefit people's lives, these things are important for everybody, not just for scientists. So to me, I think we have a moral imperative to engage beyond the academic community. And that's been, yeah, a, a real theme in my career of, of doing both of those sides, both the academic work and research and um, making sure that I am a responsible citizen. Fantastic. Okay, a follow-up on that. You mentioned curiosity-driven research a bit before and um, you talked about funding earlier. Dr Susie also has a really great TEDx talk on curiosity driven or what we call blue sky research, which I can highly recommend that our listeners tune into. And you can find it on both YouTube and TEDx Sydney, or just go to tinyearl.com forward slash Susie Curiosity. That's S-U-Z-I-E Curiosity. It's all lowercase, all one word. It's a fantastic TEDx video. Go and have a look at it. And this brings up a most curious issue, Susie, that you may or may not wish to comment on uh, about funding. Here in Australia, our federal government invests in ARC-funded research, and that's a great thing, the Australian Research Council, but we had a crazy situation here last Christmas Eve where the minister responsible for research funding banned half a dozen research projects which had been previously approved and recommended by the very panel of highly qualified experts in the field who were appointed by the government. Now, if it wasn't hard enough to get ARC funding without some politicians sticking their beak in, now I wager you've been following this scandal. I have. And I think you know, so much has been said about it. Uh, but I think fundamentally, I, I mean, having come from the UK research system to the Australian system, I was pretty shocked that there is such a uh, approach here that it is possible for ministers to intervene at such a last minute in a specific research project. So in the UK, we have something called the Haldane Principle. And that basically means that decisions on individual research proposals are best taken by the researchers themselves through peer review. So um, the government or the ministers can allocate a certain amount of money to the pot that the research council has, but then, you know, they should not be deciding which individual projects should be funded. That should be based on, on excellence. And in 2010, the science minister in the UK at the time, um, you know, elaborated on this principle and, and, you know, really did push the idea that this principle has been crucial to the international success of British science. And I want to speak just for a second as to why, why I think that is. And I'm actually going to come back to Francis Bacon, who I mentioned before. Now, he like to describe or in, in one passage described three different levels or grades of 
ambition of humankind. Uh, you know, this is quite a broad concept that I'm bringing to answer this question here, but bear with me. So the first kind of greater grade of ambition of humankind that he described was to gain power for yourself within your nation or country. Now he described this as vulgar and degenerate. So, you know, you're a self-serving person who just wants power within your own community or your own nation. Okay, that's type one. Type two is to promote the power of your own nation or country. And while that might seem, you know, sort of superior, uh, he described it as, as having a certain amount of covetousness, right? You covet that your country or your people or your humans around you should have more than other countries. The third type was for the betterment of humanity as a whole within the universe, which is a much larger, wider ambition. Now, I think that research sits in category three, yep. that the idea of doing research uh, and the fundamental reason why a government who support a country's population and is funded by uh, taxpayers' money, why it should support that is for the betterment of humanity within the universe. Now, okay, you can say, yeah, and it would be great if it helped our country as well. But I, I think perhaps focusing overly on number two, on the promotion of the power of your own nation or the betterment of your own individual people beyond people on the rest of the earth is, I think Bacon is right, a bit covetous, isn't it? So I think the reason that this whole scandal really conflicts with the values and principles of a lot of academic researchers, including myself, is that it's aiming at the wrong level of human ambition. Yep. And I'll leave it there. Yep. <laughs> Yep, fair enough. And categories one and two are today's headlines that we need more of category three. Now, before we wrap up, you've written a book that will be released very soon. The Matter of Everything, 12 Experiments That Changed the World. I've put in my pre-order with Dimix here in Australia, and listeners can put in their pre-orders with quite a few international suppliers, or just get it when it hits your favourite bookstore uh, around the end of April, the beginning of May. But it's a huge undertaking, I know. Please tell us about your book, Susie. Thanks. Yeah, it's um gosh, it's been a it's been a long, uh, a long journey. Um, but the idea behind this book really came from my experience as an experimental scientist and really um trying to get people to appreciate um the enormous contribution that's been made to society, not just through theoretical ideas of science and of physics in particular, but also that fundamentally our subject is about the real world. And therefore, the way we make real progress is by getting in there and actually doing experiments. So this book tells the story of 12 key experiments in the history of mostly particle physics and how it was that people actually went in there and built equipment that allowed us to understand the fundamental nature of our universe from quarks to x-rays to uh, the Higgs boson much more recently, obviously. And a couple of big things came out of it for me. And, and I, I hope readers will sort of take this away when, if, they, if they read the book. And one was just how much of a human story this is and, and, and how, how important the human elements of doing science are. And I hope that by including a lot of the stories, both of, of the scientists who we know and love, Ernest Rutherford, JJ Thompson, those kinds of people, but also some lesser known scientists like women who worked with them and in their labs and perhaps didn't have the fulfilled careers that their male peers had. By including all of these stories, I'm sort of hoping to, to humanise the process and also bring bring physics away from this idea of a few lone geniuses who, uh, you know, who discovered everything and see it more as a, as a progression of people working together um, to do absolutely incredible things. Now, the other thing that comes out of it is with these experiments is the sort of real world impact that has happened as a result of what we've discovered or serendipitous discoveries or even intentional applications of what we've learned through these different experiments. And here we get everything from all of our modern medical technologies to some of the technology inside the iPhone to the World Wide Web uh, to the entire electronics industry. So, you know, it's no small thing what has been achieved by going into the lab and trying to understand fundamental physics. 
So again, it's trying to link that curiosity-driven and applied research, showing how actually they're part of the same curiosity-driven investigation of how our universe works and what a wonderful thing that is. Fantastic. And look, I need to apologise now. We've just run over time. I only booked you up for an hour, but I hope we can squeeze <laughs> in these last couple of things. The book looks and sounds fabulous, and I can't wait to read it. And the reviewers have seen the preview copies, have said very nice things about it. I love what Brian Eno said about it. He said, fascinating and highly readable, an all-action thriller laced with some of the most profound ideas humans have ever had. So to finish up, is there anything else we should watch out for in the near future in the world of particle or accelerator physics, Susie? What else are you keeping your eye on? Oh, goodness, there's so many things. Um, I think one of the things I'm keeping my eye on is entirely new technologies that might lead us to the next generation of particle accelerators. Um, and here I'm talking about things like using high power lasers to drive particle beams and plasmas and things like this. So yes. there's a lot of that happening around the world at the moment. Um, I'm keeping my eye on when that makes a sufficient breakthrough that I'm willing to then uh, jump in, grab it and embrace that technology in the fields that I work on. Fantastic. And that fusion reactor maintaining uh, five seconds of uh, reaction is just awesome. Okay. Oh, that was exciting. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Susie Shi. On behalf of all of our listeners, it's been really fabulous to be speaking with you. Thank you especially for your time and your amazing schedule, your generosity. Safe travels back to the UK for your visit. And those on social media should follow Susie's Twitter feed. She's at Susie She. And get the book, The Matter of Everything, 12 Experiments That Changed Our World. It's scheduled to be published at the end of April in the UK. And you can put in a pre-order on any reputable book dealer online. Congratulations on all your great work. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Brendan. Bye. Okay, <clears throat> this is VK3, well, VK3CSJ on the microphone, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3CSJ. It was a little bit complex uh, in trying to uh, activate this microphone as uh, uh, I, <laughs> it's just uh, in a different uh, circuit, so to speak, and it would have cre created a little bit of interruption during that so I just left it alone but for those watching the ATV uh, side of it um, you would have uh, <coughs> there was a constant ID there anyway I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview courtesy of uh, Brendan O'Brien's uh, um, website the uh, uh, astrophys.com and if you're listening there uh, uh, Brendan uh, just uh, send us an email um, be curious to know if you managed to tune in to uh, tonight's uh, session um, we were going to do it last week, uh, but uh, it was uh, very much a uh, last moment thing, and uh, I um, decided, well, we'll leave it till this this week. <laughs> and uh, it was going to be a two-parter, but I thought, no, I'll leave it. It was just just too good to uh, to interrupt by um, putting a stopper in it for a, a week stop because who was going to remember, you know, what happened last week? So I decided to go with it. Uh, but uh, some of the comments on the um, uh, on the chat window there se seem to be all in favour of uh, tonight anyway and the uh, the broadcast the way it's uh, gone across so uh, I'm uh, pleased that uh, that's occurred um, anyway yeah so like I said uh, after hearing um, uh, reading the introduction uh, to um, there it's it seems like uh, uh, that one singular trip <laughs> and I'm going to say it one singular trip to uh, our dark sky site um, up at uh, Heathcote uh, the Astronomical Society's uh, Victoria Dark Sky site, the Leon Mao Dark Sky site, uh, inspired her to uh, to do some fairly amazing things, and it's um, you know it's it, it, and that's all it's got to take, just one decent long look at the sky and the stars uh, up there at night time, and if that doesn't change your life, then uh, nothing will. But um, 
Yeah, as uh, Brendan said, the uh, the comments on the back of the book here um, from Brian Eno, uh, as he says, this fascinating and highly reliable, readable book captures the radical excitement of experimental science as it's being made. It's uh, an all-action thriller laced with some of the most profound ideas humans have ever had. And then from uh, uh, another person by the name of Andrew Steele, uh, a magical tour of great experiments defining the most incredible century in physics. And uh, another comment from uh, An- Ananyo Bachitiara. It's one of those names. Uh, Dr. Shi. Uh, adultery brings a, 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 a Nority, I don't know what that word is. Uh, brings together a glittering cast of ca- characters to tell that the uh, the story of the most fundamental of all sciences. And from Dana Burnt from Dean Burnett, uh, sometimes how science, sometimes how scientific discoveries came about is even more interesting than the discoveries themselves. A fascinating book, and uh, from Jim Al Cahill, uh, storytelling at its very best. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but uh, it's just over an inch uh, thick. Uh, it's about uh, how many pages there? Um, last number I see here is. Uh, 313 pages long um, and uh, one one quick scan through the book reveals absolutely no pictures <laughs> no images no graphs no nothing it's just text 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 so if you don't mind uh, a good long read that's what this uh, book will definitely uh, give it to you um, and uh, uh, yeah, okay, just check, checking the index for certain things, but uh, I can't see. I was looking for a name, but I can't see. No, I'm not in there. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> anyway, all right. Uh, I've gone well over time. As Brendan said, he's, uh, he, he, <laughs> he booked the hour for it and went over time. Well, I don't think he did, actually. it's um, it was It came in about 55 minutes, that interview, so there you go. All right. Um, I haven't prepared anything else i just went straight into it so um we shall uh, conclude the uh, tonight's uh, transmission uh, anybody who's interested in the astronomical society of victoria please visit uh, asv uh, the um, www.asv.org.au <coughs> the website uh, www.asv.org.au which this broadcast is on behalf of um, vk3 echo kilo hotel is the official call sign for the society Every Friday night we do a broadcast here kicking off at 10 o'clock um, and uh, usually I run SSB on 80 metres so I, I hope the AM transmission tonight hasn't upset anybody. Um, so uh, apologies if that, uh, if the, the wide missions has caused a, a bit of an angst to the CW f- friends down there. <laughs> that didn't mean to. But uh, no, next week we'll probably be yeah, back to uh, SSB. Um, depends on what people say. If everybody's had a thumbs up for AM, I'm quite happy to continue doing AM because <laughs> I, I think the AM mode uh, brings a, dif- a different uh, depth to uh, to the uh, overall sound. Um, nevertheless, uh, so on that note, this is VK3 EKH uh, concluding transmissions for uh, this evening on 1865 kilohertz in the 80 meter. Sorry, in the 160 uh, medium wave service. And um, I hope everybody there on 160s uh, had some fun listening to a bit of decent AM. And uh, again, if if there is anybody listening on 160, just send us a uh, uh, a quick signal report to VK3 EKH at gmail dot com, and uh, that'll be great. Uh, so there'll be a quick callback if there's anybody still around. Uh, there'll be a quick callback on 3541. I'll go to SSB for that, guys. Uh, I won't uh, stick with the AM uh, for call the callback. So everybody can select lower sideband and uh, we'll pick it up on SSB uh, in just a moment. This is VK3 EKH, uh, concluding transmissions 1865 kHz, and uh, we'll be back next uh, Friday to do it all again, back to the normal uh, standard program. Although there are a lot of uh, other podcasts I, I could play, and I was doing a string of podcasts earlier on, but uh, um, uh, it just the, the, there's just not enough time in an hour sometimes <laughs> to get everything squeezed in. This is VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone, uh, concluding transmissions on 160 and uh, standby stations on 80 meters. Okay, so that's dropped 160. <coughs> 
you know, I, I for for those still listening on on eighty here, uh, one one thing I've, I'm really happy about one sixty lately. My, I've been putting up with a lot of uh, switch mode power supply noise, and it's cleared up. It's gone. Um, although on on AM the noise floors as I speak is hovering around eighteen over nine. So we've got a fairly high noise level, but the uh, square wave aspect to it's disappeared. Thank God for that. Anyway, like I said, I hope I haven't kept you all up for too long. I and mean, what's happening tomorrow? You know, you can, you can all sleep in, so there's nothing particularly important tomorrow. So, <laughs> all right, uh, my pad. I need my pad and uh, a, a pen. And uh, got me pen. Is it writing? Yes, it's writing. So let's stand by stations. Um, we'll just do that. Go to a new pad. Microphone is in the way here. Sorry about all that noise I'm creating. And um, okay, I think uh, I think we can go across to uh, lower sideband. So uh, I should be able to do this on the fly, really. This is VK3CSJ. We're going to change mode to uh, lower sideband. So uh, here we go. There we go. Look at that. Straight on to it. We can do it while we're still transmitting. This is VK3 EKH. Uh, listening on 3541 kilohertz. Uh, for any stations wishing to uh, to check in uh, for a, a quick uh, call back and see how you, the uh, tonight session went for everybody. VK3 CSJ listening. All right, I think there might have been a, another station there too. We've got VK3JR, VK3VIN, 3HDX, 5KKT. Anybody else? Uh, VK3CJ. Okay. All right, across to you there, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH. Yeah, no worries, Frank. <coughs> VK3JR, VK3EKH returning. Very good. Thanks for the the report. And I agree, totally agree with all comments there. Um, you know, I, I think the uh, I think um, uh, women in science is empowering, and uh, there's a lot of them making that way. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, we shouldn't, uh, you know. S step on it in any way. We've, we've got to get in there, and they, you know, the ladies see things from different angles, and um, their thinking and mentality is uh, quite different. So, um, you know, having, a, I mean, you, you can go back to the, uh, um, uh, the 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 computers, female computers, the, in the early NASA days. Uh, you know how they were involved, and what they were involved with, and how that was all sort of kept quiet for a while. Thank goodness for that movie that came out. Um, it's, uh, it's it deserves to be watched again, I think. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I totally agree with you there, Frank. And uh, yes, uh, Susie's doing some great things. So um, um, I think that interview really revealed things. During the the interview, I, I played uh, a YouTube sequence um, uh, on uh, on the TV system, uh, the uh, uh, stream. <coughs> and uh, she's uh, clearly done, has done a, a few YouTube uh, clips, the TED 
uh, as well, a series perhaps. Um, I'm going to sit back and watch a lot more of those uh, uh, interesting lectures that are, that she's done. The, the one that I played, I, I didn't play any audio, I just played the, the vision side of it for the TV aspect. And um, oh, there was some funny experiment she was trying to do with a, a rotating section and a ball. It kind of worked for a few few seconds before the ball went flinging off, and I I don't know if that's what she was trying to illustrate or whether the, the instrument itself that she was using wasn't so good. But <laughs> but we have to go and listen to the the text now to see or the the dialogue to to hear what the, that experiment was all about. So we'll, we'll come back to that a little later on, I think. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, Frank. Across to you there, Ian VK three V. I get say good day to Steve too for us a little later on too. By the way, Frank um, VK three V I N VK. Three EKH. I agree. Thanks, Ian. VK3VIN, VK3EKH. Yes, I saw your uh, email and uh, acknowledged uh, um, no signal on 160. Yeah, look, I'm I'm on the vertical for for a start, and uh, I think if uh, Mike up at Batemans Bay came up uh, VK2ABT, he'd 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 give me a good report. Um, he usually does, so I, I know I'm getting out. Uh, but it's uh, it's, uh, it, it's it is important that um, yeah you have a bit of wire in the sky for 160. <laughs> Uh, and of course the AM, um, look the AM is only uh, worthwhile if you can um, s select your f a wide filter uh, because um, uh, my bandwidth was uh, a little on the wide side and um, it helps to have uh, a little bit, you know, no less than 6K, no, no less than 6K wide. But if you can select um, 9, 10 kilohertz and 12 ideally, uh, then you've got lots of fidelity there. But that's another story. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Look, I, I, um, um, 
I'll, I'll keep the AM service running on 160 because for those who, who do want to listen to the AM, which, as people are saying, it adds that different feel to it. I love the phase distortion. Uh, I think the phase distortion is really one, one of those little details to broadcasting that I picked up on as a shortwave listener when I was a, a much younger lad. And... Um, the, it's just a characteristic of uh, propagation and uh, the, the way uh, radio waves bounce around. <laughs> Mind you, if you've got a receiver that has um, uh, synchronous um, um, amplitude modulation, uh, you've got a, a, a mode that uh, quite possibly would uh, reduce the uh, the phase distortion side of things. Um, in fact, uh, the Kiwi SDR, uh, if you ever explore that, uh, the um, the Kiwi SDR, I know the Kiwi SDR that Paul's got up, VK3KHZ, uh, you can select uh, SAM mode, and um, uh, which does reveal a few different uh, aspects to the, to the sound. That's another story. All right, thanks, uh, Ian. Across to you there, Don. VK3HDX, VK3EKH. Yeah, no problem. VK3HDX, VK3EKH. Yeah, thanks, Don. And uh, I know you're, you're um, well, I, at least I imagine that you're listening on via the, uh, the NN8000, so I, I know that can, uh, has a, a, a variable filter on that quite wide. But, um, uh, yes, no, thanks. Well, I mean, this is interesting feedback I'm getting because it tells me the less I'm on the microphone, the better. <laughs> Ah uh, dear. Well, look, like I said, um, when it came when it came to um, uh, to the podcasts, uh, I I was planning on um, uh, working my way through all the podcasts that Brendan's uh, got available because Brendan's given me permission to play. Them. He's most happy uh, that I give them a uh, a bit of an airing, and. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, some of them, the, the timing of them tend to vary a little bit. Not as long as tonight's session, though, that's for sure. Most of the uh, podcasts, particularly the, the main interview, not not the entire, he goes for about an hour, and all I do is in, it, is edit out the, the main interview um, that he has. So, uh, uh, and I, uh, I, I play that. Um, so maybe I can reinvestigate that, just as a bit of a variety. And uh, when I when, actually when it comes to doing the podcast uh, replays, maybe I can uh, come up on AM for that particularly. Um, and when I'm when I'm just dedicating an hour to myself, waffling away, I'll, I'll stay SSB. I'll think about that. Anyway, <laughs> oh dear, thanks, Tom. All right, sorry, Ian, it's your turn. VK five kilo kilo tango two worlds VK three EKH. Go ahead, mate. Just about. 
Ah, beautiful. Thanks, Ian. VK5, KKT, Two Worlds, VK3, EKH, with VK3, CSJ on the microphone. Thanks, Ian. Uh, it's a really good positive feedback there, and uh, I, I really do love your comments. So, um, uh, it's uh, there's a, a few votes here uh, in favour of AM, I think. So... <laughs> Uh, it's a it's a voting time, isn't it? All right, thanks, Ian. Thanks very much, mate. And uh, we'll see if we can implement uh, a few little changes here over the next few weeks, perhaps, just for the sake of it. I mean, we're coming into a good part of the year. Win winter is a good time for 80 meters, so uh, uh, yeah, running a decent AM signal will probably go a long way, more ways than one. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Jack VK3TJS in Shepparton VK3EKH go. For it. Thanks, Jack. VK3 EKH. Uh, sorry, VK3 TJS. VK3 EKH returning. Very good. Uh, temperature is here 6 6.7 degrees at the moment. 6.7 degrees outside. Uh, so it's a little nip eye, um, but it's pleasant here. Um, yeah, it's uh, 24. 24 inside with all the valves I've got running here at the moment. It's that's uh, supplying enough warmth. I can tell you. Uh, I don't know whether you're watching YouTube, but uh, the uh, most of the warmth is coming from the the couple of l linear amplifiers that are running in the background there. So um, um, <laughs> anyway, all right. Thanks, Jake. Thanks very much. Yes, I um, I, I started right on 10 o'clock. Uh, the first 15 minutes was dedicated to uh, a, a plug for Susie's book and uh, reading uh, a little bit of the introduction, and then we went straight into the podcast. So uh, it was full on. All right. Any other stations wishing to check in? VK3 EKH. All right. VK7 JAH. Uh, have a say there, Martin. Got you there, Dave. Thanks, Dave. VK, uh, se sorry, Martin. <laughs> VK seven J A H. VK three E K H. Very good. No worries there, uh, Martin. Um, just out of interest, uh, um, uh, 
As far as the mode is concerned, would you, for you, would you have preferred SSB or would the AM be uh, more than adequate uh, for copy? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, thanks, Martin. Good enough. VK7, uh, JH, VK3, EKH routine. No, that's fair enough comments, too. Um, yep, all right, all noted. And uh, <laughs> uh, like I said, I think I'll uh, I'll select the AM mode uh, on the whim, and uh, depending on what, I'm, what it is I'm going to broadcast, whether it's a, a podcast like tonight uh, or whether it's just the, the usual run-of-the-mill program that I do. So I'll, I'll make that on the fly, I think. Maybe. Anyway, uh, Dave, get out to you there, mate. VK3JL, VK3EKH. Yeah, VK3EKH, uh, Dave, uh, Dave, uh, Dave, uh, Dave, uh, Dave, Yeah, thanks, Dave. VK3 JL, VK3 EKH. Yeah, hidden figures. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I think I've got that on Blu-ray downstairs. Um, I'll I'll check the streaming services and see if uh, if it's available through uh, the Foxtel or something else that we've got here. Multiple subscriptions to. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, thanks, Dave. Good signal from you too. Twenty over nine plus at the moment, so you're you're booming through too. All right. Um, okay. If there's no other stations, we'll uh, conclude uh, tonight's session since it's uh, twenty to twelve. But that's still quite early. I oh, know it's about normal, really. Um, <laughs> is there any other stations wishing to check in? VK three EKH. All righty then. Thanks everybody, everybody for tuning in tonight. All the folks there on uh, the uh, chat window that's uh, come up: uh, Kim VK5 F- FUSE, uh, Richard VK3 VRS, uh, and Dave VK3 JL, uh, and I think there might have been a few others up the top there. Uh, Martin VK7 JH, and uh, this mouse is not working quite very well for me. Keeps bouncing all around. Anyway, I think that's pretty much all there was on the on the chat window tonight. Um, Cassiopeia was there, yeah, were you? I've gone back to last week, yeah, I went back just to last week, alright. Paul, VK3 Delta Alpha, yep, thanks Paul, and I think that's about it. Yeah, and Mike, VK3 XL, all on the chat window. Thanks to Dr. Susie Shi uh, for tonight's session, I, I know she's not listening, but... She's probably in the middle of the uh, some serious scientific experiment, so <laughs> um, or at least uh, getting ready to vote. I don't know. I'm not sure where she is. But anyway, thanks everybody for um, uh, tuning in tonight. Much appreciated, and uh, we'll we'll be back all next uh, week to do it all again on these uh, airs. So uh, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Wishing everybody a very pleasant weekend, and um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what rocks on tomorrow night with everything else that's going on. So um, this is VK3 EKH uh, with VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet on the mic, including transmissions, and uh, we'll see you all next week. And uh, to everybody on the YouTube channel, I hope there's uh, quite a few people that have been tuning in on YouTube. So uh, thanks for watching. On, oh, I'm looking at the wrong camera uh, on, <laughs> on YouTube. This is VK3 EKH concluding transmissions on 3541 kHz. All right. 
So, those watching on TV, it's this camera. It's this camera, not that camera. Um, thank you for watching, and uh, and uh, we'll uh, probably catch up with uh, you folks on ATV uh, throughout the weekend, no doubt. Uh, I'll be doing the WA broadcast on uh, Sunday morning, and if there's a solar a solar weather report from Tamitha, I'll play that. I think she's in the middle of recording a. Uh, uh, a, a quick report as I speak so uh, there'll be if there's anything available by Sunday morning I'll uh, I'll run the uh, the latest solar report from Tamitha if it's available otherwise it'll be just the WA broadcast and then the next on the list will be uh, the ATV net next Sunday sorry next uh, Tuesday <sighs> at 8 o'clock <laughs> uh, dear Anyway, all right, we're out of here. Thanks for watching. This is VK3EKH, concluding the TV service for tonight and the YouTube system. So, um, thanks for watching. We'll be back next week. Stand by for Colour Bars.